we really felt that um, our technology could change people's relationship with technology. A lot of people are frustrated with technology and how it works. And we said, we want to be the answer to that. When, and man, they, we speak different languages, right? You get an artist who knows how to use Adobe tools and you get a developer who knows what build servers and you try and get them work together. Wow. Alrighty, hello everyone and welcome to the Deal Maker Show. So I'm very excited about the uh, founder that we have today because he's not the typical founder from Silicon Valley or from New York City. He's uh, actually a founder from Ottawa and there's a lot of great stuff happening in Canada actually. And he's done it multiple times. He actually just recently did a pretty, a pretty good exit. Uh, and we're going to be covering, we're going to be covering that process and that story. But without further ado, let's welcome our guest today, Jason Flick. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to spending time with you. So originally growing up there in a small town in Canada. So how was life growing up? Um, yeah, in a small town, there's not much to do, right? So I think um, it, it certainly, uh, you, you had to go find your own things to entertain yourself. And luckily, it was in the early days of technology. So the, uh, my dad was fortunate enough to buy me a computer. And that was, uh, I would say, almost dwarfed, I think, the relevancy of, uh, aside from just kind of doing a lot of odd jobs, you learn what hard work is when you're in a small town. You have to, you know, we were, tobacco was a major industry in our town. So learning what that was. And then, yeah, just fell in love with computers and started coding at, uh, know age seven or eight i guess a timex sinclair 1000 or something 4k of memory that's for anybody who's a geek so what, what what do you think really got you hooked so much to computers yeah i think you know i always and, and i think like a lot of entrepreneurs uh, you know add could do two things at once always wanting to to keep things going and so technology really allowed me to do that um and so anytime i could get on that technology figure that stuff out i think it really engaged me and that you know, so self-taught in a lot of cases, because it was, you know, um, in those days, there wasn't computer computer uh, development courses available in high school. Um, so, And very early on uh, in your career, you actually landed big responsibility jobs and starting with being at the airport. So what were you doing at the airport? Yeah, it's funny. I remember I saw so as my first year university and I, you know, um, ended up in the end funding my way through university, which is always a good lesson. But it, the airport was close by the place we stayed at. And they had recently acquired a piece of software from someone who had their their health had been diminishing um, enough. And it was done in Visual Basic, which at that time wasn't too cool, but it, they had been working on it for so long. And so I was able to take over the entire operations of that software for the airport. Um, uh, and it was a government run airport it was smaller than the main one. And yeah, they, a, lot, a lot of diversity and experience learning how to do the requirements gathering talk. And then I sat at the airport coding it. So I got to see it in action. So I think there's a lot of really good lessons. I was VP, CEO, QA, tester, developer, designer, architect, all in one. So I think I was able to be a good foundation for, um, my future jobs. Well, talking about future jobs, I mean, you, you did bounce quite a bit as an engineer. So uh, before you actually went at it as an entrepreneur yourself. So, so what do you think, what was the, the catalyst for you to say, you know what, I'm going to go at it? Because, I mean, you were working for companies like LibreAxus, TouchLink, FDI, uh, and all in the engineering department. So perhaps, you know, there's great things that you learned along the way. I mean, I think that we're talking here about like maybe like five or six years that it took you until you actually went at it. Uh, and I'm sure that you learned a lot. But what were some of the biggest lessons that you learned? And what was that time where you said, you know what, perhaps, you know, it makes sense for me to to go at it as an entrepreneur? Yeah, so I think the, the good thing is I always had some sort of business on the side. I knew I was an entrepreneur, but I also knew technology is where I wanted to do it. And you, you do need to become a bit of an expert. I think it's not, you know, there is it's great to be a bit oblivious about how painful it might be to do something or how long it would take, but you do need to kind of be a subject matter expert. And so for me, I just kind of stayed committed to those years to working my way up, learning um, how to develop and learn how to uh, manage people, learn what the real ins and outs are of running a business before I did it. I think I would have even continued a bit longer had I had the choice, but the big tech meltdown happened um, in 2000. Um, our city, um, Ottawa, which I think 80,000 some people out of the million people here were in tech and half of them were unemployed at that time. So 
you know, kind of, okay, I guess now's the time to start my business now that there are kind of no jobs. So it did trigger that event earlier and I'm, I'm glad it did, but it meant I had to learn a lot more on the job. I hear you. So then let's talk about Enable Technologies, which was your first uh, company. I mean, how do you, um, you know, really come to the, to the realization it's time to take the leap of faith? Yeah, so so there was a so that was a bit different in the fact that there was a bunch of us and there was a, a complete reboot of what was there. But that was the first time it was like ground zero, reboot brand, reboot what we're doing. Um, and um, took on a C level role, built that team. We we probably added fifty or sixty people pretty quickly. Um, got product market fit very quickly. Um, and then um, of course, then September eleventh happened, and that really ground that down. So that that business I think was on, and of course sold, you know intended went on for the next 15 years and did incredibly well selling the solar winds and getting a huge footprint in that space but it had a really tough run after the uh, september 11th and, and watching out for these inflection points is is so key for what you're trying to do but yeah that uh that slowed them they were they were right at the point where they could have i think dominated that space and then it got sh shut down for quite a while so you ended up leaving so um yeah. so tell us about you know like that uh... I guess leaving your baby behind to perhaps go and start another one. Yeah, so I mean, I think the big lesson learned there is sales, just how important that is. You you get you know, great. technologists loves technology. They love people love who love technology love to sell to people who know technology because they get it. But you know, we really simplified the process there. I think that was my big lesson. In fact, we got to the point where we were our the core focus was on these um, hardware sales companies, which were making two percent margins, right? This is, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago um, and, uh, you know, two, three percent margins. And we were going in, taking a piece of software and giving them 30, 40 percent margins, boot camping them so they could understand it. And they would put this software on their client sites. So to me, I learned, OK, technology is great and you've got to make it work. And I thought as an engineer, that was what mattered. But really learned about the whole ecosystem and how you have to, if you need to, you need to become a training firm. And so we created a whole group just to boot camp these uh, companies that only knew hardware into software. So I certainly learned a lot of that, but um, it's always tricky when there's a lot of uh, co-founders and different aspects to it. And I really wanted to do something, um, I think, on my own and be able to lead it. And that's kind of when it went into Flick Software. So then what happened next with Flick Software? Yeah, so it was middle of a tech meltdown, so there was no funding available. Um, I said, okay, we'll make this a service firm. A lot of the business I'd been uh, prior to that had a service component, so we'll start off with services and we'll we'll find cool projects. We'll learn about it. I'll build a team up, and then when we find the right opportunity, I'll have the funding, the capital, the team, the office space to kind of jump on it. Um, and so we did a whole bunch of projects for Amtrak and uh, museums and uh, the military, and learned a lot about mobile tech. Um, until the iPhone came out. So what, what happened with the iPhone? <laughs> right, yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we were at Flick Software. I ran into my co-founder, Stuart Russell, um, who is just a, a brilliant scientist and developer and um, hired him on the spot into Flick and said, you know, they're going to make you part of this um, thing that we're figuring out what's going on. The iPhone came out. We got our hands on and played with it. And, and really, we looked at it and said, you know, what's the difference between an iPhone and a video game? And I gave it, I'd given it to my wife who had had all the previous Blackberries and Nokias. She wanted nothing to do with them. She loved the iPhone. I gave it to my two-year-old daughter at the time, who of course had no clue what it was. She hated all the previous Blackberries and Nokias. She loved the iPhone. And we said, this is a transformation in how people um, relate to technology and Apple's not going to license it. And so we actually um, created a complete clone of it. We were the number and again, this is whatever, 15 years ago, we were the number one tech video in like seven or eight countries for quite some time, got two or 3000 emails from this complete copy of Apple, which then they threatened to sue us. And we, we backed down, of course, it wasn't the intent, but I just want to show, look, you can take these kind of great experiences. And we had them working on all the hardware that wasn't Apple, uh, like Apple. And so it'll okay, get this is something we want to spin a business up on a head page, went on a uh, homepage of Engadget for a while, which really helped. And so we said, let's start off a business. So um, took us a few months to come up with a name, spun it out of the company and um, really doubled down on this, taking this incredible experience um, that Apple gives you and, and enabling it for everybody to have it. So and we started working literally with hardware vendors like Sony and Canon and Kobo up here in Canada to give them Apple-like experiences. You know, it's interesting because Flick Software was the... Um the segue for you to 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 probably your biggest success to date, you know, which uh, with an amazing outcome, 
but I'm wondering, you know, like Flick Software obviously didn't have the outcome that you had desired. Uh, and and really, as they say, you know, you, you don't learn so much from successes. You learn more when, you know, you haven't been able to really get it to where you had expected. No? So what, what, was, what, what lesson was there for you to be learned? Yeah. Wow. Um, a lot. Um, I, I think the, the biggest one that I took into UI was the fact that, you know, technology is becoming a commodity, right? When I started that business back in 2000, it was really cool to get information in your hands to go to a mobile worker and give them a piece of data that's useful in real time. But that was, that was not enough. Now it had to be usable. It had to be engaging. They had to want to use it. And so, you know, kind of mixing art and science was a big lesson I learned. We, we didn't even at Flix Offer, we'd say, oh, you want this coded? Great. It'll be, you know, uh, this much money to code it. And we didn't even budget for design. It's like, well, we'll just use some clip art. Like we were so bad. Um, and so I think that's a big one. Um, people for sure, you know, one, one world-class coder can do what a team of five or 10 can. So, and, um, you know, getting the right team in place. And so, uh, at the time we had no budget, so it was just a whole collection of people, many that just couldn't get jobs because of the tech meltdown in 2000. Um, so, um, I certainly learned that you really, you need to get the right people and at whatever price it costs, you need to, you need to get them. And, and that, that was a big lesson learned for me, for sure. It's, there, there's no commoditization of that kind of building new things. It, you've got to get the right people. And almost in parallel, um, you had started UITV. I mean, pretty interesting. So, so tell us about how UITV really comes into the picture and how, you know, you really worked to, to bring it to life. Yeah, I think I, I realized very, almost immediately this was going to be a complete cultural um, change for, um, it was almost a, a an inflection point in my life or my career where I knew what I had done and how I had done in the past wasn't what's going to work going forward. So I immediately spun it out. Um, I was able to leverage a lot of the infrastructure um, and some of the connections and things through Flix offer, but it was its own entity right out of the gate and they helped each other. That was when one had a good quarter, sometimes the other one didn't. So they were helpful to each other. Um, but yeah, I created a separate entity um, as quickly as I could move that, that team that made sense into there and um, put my focus as much as I could onto that one. But it was a few years too, where you're trying to balance both. I was CEO of both companies, um, showing that you care about both, um, trying to grow both, deal with, you know, what are the biggest issues across two companies? Ultimately, I think it's very hard to do. If you're, if one's a high growth company, I, I don't think you can be the CEO of two high growth companies. And so eventually I did get CEOs and, and just let Flix offer be a, um, you know, a sandbox for some other entrepreneurs to kind of try different things out. So then UITV, what ended up being the business model? Yeah, so it, it was almost was, so initially it was uh, helping hardware companies. So the first four or five years we were, okay, we want to help companies compete with the iPhone, right? You know, just in general with a great experience. So we did a per device model, royalty model, which is pretty typical, a um, dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, depending on, on what the hardware was. Um, but after doing that for about four years, building up a lot of the core IP and, and Stuart's IP, my co-founder was a, a good piece of it, but we had to build a lot more on top of that. And we would be building these platforms and we would show them, you know, one of our customers, a lot of these tier one electronics manufacturers, look, we have this great experience we built, you know, as you asked, by the way, look, it works all on all the other devices. And that was just weird for them. They really wanted to know that they'd built something custom that could only run on their hardware. So we learned pretty soon that we weren't firing on all cylinders. And I'd also looked at a couple other companies. One of the companies we were modeling ourselves after, which got bought by RIM, was uh, TAT, the Astonishing Tribe. And one of the spoke to the founder there, and their cap was all these hardware manufacturers have accounting systems that'll never let any one software get on more than 20 or 30% of their hardware. And so I f did the math. We're going to get capped really quickly with this market. Um, the app market, of course, was now picking up, and apps can get on any platform, and you charge your license on top of that. So we pretty quickly changed to a model where it was per app, and we went more after the TV, because TV needs to get everywhere. And um, the unique thing that we did was brought video game thinking to the app market, and I still think no one has done that yet. Um, and, and now it's in the hands of, uh, of at and and Time Warner. And so this idea that you can have go right to the metal, get a great experience, so that was the key piece. And I think then we said, okay, we've got to focus on app stores. There's no limit. 10,000 apps in the app store, they all pay us a license fee. So it kind of broke that issue that I'd seen this uh, uh, company we were trying to model ourselves after a bit. Um, and that really let us scale the, the business in that market and then focus on, on TV and went after the, the major media brands. So then 
obviously here there was a really big, uh, I would say, breakthrough for you when it comes to really understanding the importance of customer focus. So yeah. tell us about why customer focus, let's say, was so important for you guys and how should perhaps some of those entrepreneurs that are watching and listening right now think about customer focus for their own business. Yeah, I certainly probably spent, those are the hardest ones, right, for leads to come in and you say no to them. But um, one of the things I learned at Flick Software was that, you know, if um, a big company wanted to run, like we did a, a bunch of things in the kiosk space too, because it was kind of mobile tech and um, we would go and bid on a solution. We could do it for a million bucks. Um, another startup that was only, we were like 30 people, uh, that was like four people said they could do it for a hundred thousand bucks. And then if IBM bid on it's 10 million. Um, and so we really learned that this, the scale matters a lot in terms of the client and how much they want and, and why, why try and struggle in those lower end markets. So that was, you know, that was the, the choice we made. We wanted to build a premium product. So, and that really changed a lot about who we wanted to focus on. But also I think we did a lot of working on who are the profiles for our clients. Um, I'm a big fan of crossing the chasm. So, okay, great. We haven't crossed the chasm yet. This idea that you can write one app, which is more like a video game than an app. No one's done it. No one understands it. So you had to find these agents of change, but we also knew that we wanted to do a premium solution. So it couldn't be um, an agent of change running in a small firm. So we had to really hunt for these, um, the profiles, these people that wanted to make a name for themselves, had budget, um, user experience was the number one thing and getting on a bunch of platforms and constantly going through that. And then each one of those took a year to close, six months to a year. So you had to be really careful what came in the funnel. Um, we threw away way more leads than we chased after. And I think that was a big part of our success. If we chased all leads, we would have done a, a thin amount of, amount of effort on all of them and probably not closed many deals. So looking at, at you know, what, what's number one for them, one of my questions would always be, okay, so you've got, you know, you're kicking off. One of our customers was Show Me. No one's heard of it, but it was the Netflix killer in Canada, which didn't do well. But I, I, you know, they had hundreds of things to do. They had to buy content. They had to get servers. They had, I said, of all the things you have to do, where does experience, this end experience? And if it wasn't in the top three, we'd just stop talking to them, right? So that was a tough lesson to learn because that's what we were bringing. We were going to bring great user experience on a lot of platforms. So just doing that, because, and I've seen, and I've done it, and I've seen other startups, they chase these leads, and they're like, it's not a great fit. And you may even close them, but wow, it's really bad for your business. There's some accounts that we closed that were off, that we did the mistake, you know, and, and they closed, and they were probably as much damaging as the big ones that were wins. So it's very, you need to be very careful for those. You can only afford to make one or two of those mistakes. And as you, and as we're talking about, like, here, breakthroughs that, that lead to becoming successful, you know, definitely customer focus was one. But the other one was, without a doubt, finding your why. Uh, but it took, in this case, more than what you had hoped. I mean, we're talking about at least a year. So what do you think, why do you think it took so long? And what triggered for you guys to really find your answer? Yeah, so I think it was because I had done a, a bunch of startups before that were just focusing on, you know, just the, the data. What does the customer want? What's the focus? What are the features? But those things, and then you look at others that don't have them all, but people are buying it for a reason, right? Um, a really simple example, you know, Starbucks, right? When you buy a Starbucks coffee, it says, if you buy a certain car, premium car, it says something about you, right? So really understanding that I think was key. And that kind of came back to who we're going to be. And so we spent a fair bit of time and said, okay, so we have this engine that can do almost anything, right? It could can solve problems in this market, but which ones and why are we doing this? And we really felt that um, our technology could change people's relationship with technology. A lot of people are frustrated with technology and how it works. And we said, we want to be the answer to that. We want to be the tool that solves that problem. We're not just going to be the, the one that can do it faster or cheaper or quicker. Um, and we really had that as our core value. And that drove things like letting us build an art team. So we were a whole bunch of geeks. Um, um, you know, um, and we were able to build an art team because they saw what our why was going to be part of that. And man, they, we speak different languages, right? You get an artist who knows how to use Adobe tools and you get a developer who knows what build servers and you try and get them work together. Wow. You know, but because of that, why, which we, um, took us about a year, like you say, to figure that out. And we spent a fair bit of time just dedicating a day here or two there just to kind of plan it out, think about it. Um, and really came up, I think our initial one came up and we've, we, we've kept with it at UI all along, but it was like make technology fun and easy to use. Now we've, we interpret that differently now, um, but that was what we came up with, uh, I guess, almost 11 years ago now. And that really drove us. That was our, our goal. 
even though every day you're doing all kinds of very specific technical things, adding features, that's what drove it. And our clients knew that and they were on a journey with us for that bigger why. And so they would know, okay, you don't have this feature, great, but I know you're aligned with what I wanna do. And so I think that was a big part for us. And like any startup, there was a roller coaster ride. Um, so those, those having that bigger thing than yourself or your market or your company as a goal really helps. So what did the uh, blending art with science look like with UITV? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the end result was we weren't going into clients because initially we'd go in and say, look, here are three balls bouncing in JavaScript and it would be bouncing at this speed. And then we say, look at these balls bouncing in ours. And they were 10 times faster. And we say, look what you imagine what you could do with 10 times the performance because we went right to the metal. Um, what it looked like was we would go into these meetings because we'd be very selective about going after certain clients. And we would actually get our team to design from the ground up what we thought they want. And we'd go into a meeting and go, boom, is this what you're looking for? Now, it wouldn't be all integrated and completed, but it would look like and feel like what it could actually be. And that's a game changer. You know, that there's most customers aren't like entrepreneurs like us and your listeners who can see the world differently and have vision. They don't. If you can't show them exactly what you're talking about and they can't touch it, it's really hard to close a deal. And I'd say we, we were able to shave months and months off deal cycles by having that team there. And then of course they could also execute on it. And so that was great as well. And then also they helped our product team because we use them internally. So there was a very cross-functional team. Um, they were used by marketing, they were used by our clients, and then we used them as our product team. And without that, I think we would never have been able to be the premium solution for these these apps and have you know, some of the biggest brands, market, the biggest media brands in the world using our tech. So then how did you capitalize the business? So, yeah, um, that's probably a, a, a book and I no no time or interest in writing one, but the, we I think we used every type of capital. Maybe somebody can can comment if I miss one. But I mean, aside from the early days of the, you know, uh, using credit cards and stuff, we used um, uh, venture debt uh, along the way. We used private equity, which is our first formal capital. We use subordinate debt, which is an interesting mixture. I'm sure about people here know that, but, you know, entrepreneurs want to look into that if you've got a bit of cash flow, that can be a good. We use bridge financing. We use convertibles. Um, and then actually our last, our C round, which was about two years ago now, that was our only f real f VC. Everything prior to that was... Um, either private equity or strategic. We actually had um, Sky slash Comcast and um, what is now Warner Media and AT&T as investors. So it was a very diverse board and I, a lot of complexities around that. But I think, um, and being based in Canada, there are certain times in Canada when you just can't raise funding. It just doesn't, there, it just turns off. Where I think in other cities, it kind of goes up and down. I think um, 2000 and I think in the year in 2000, we had something like 1.2 billion in venture capital in one year. And eight years later, the venture capital amount of money in Ottawa was 50 million. And most wow. of that was to go with the living dead. So just, I mean, wow. So you have to be, have this way where you can be pretty flexible. And so we had to, and there was um, one of the advantages in Canada is the government support. They've been really supportive from us. The program's called IRAP and Shred. So we were, we had to be, an omnivore, I guess, for capital and be very flexible. So I, I would challenge someone to find a type of capital maybe that we didn't use that that's available. So um, th I think that was um, required a lot of creativity and took time. But if you run out of capital, you're, you're out. So I always had a plan A, a plan B and a plan C. And sometimes we did have to go to that plan C option. Yeah, no, I hear you. And I guess uh, part of really understanding what's your what are your plans is surrounding yourself by the right people and getting the right type of guidance. And I know that for you, peer mentoring, you know, has has made a, a big impact and, and, and you really uh, stand by it uh, behind it. So so why don't you tell, you know, us, you know, like how peer mentoring has helped you and, and how do you think people listening and watching can really benefit from from including that as part of their own journey? Yeah, I mean, the old expression, it's lonely at the top for sure, right? Everybody's always coming to your office because they want to raise or a promotion or a new thing or to go left or go right. So and then who do you have to share that with? And maybe your wife, maybe some friends, but how many CEOs have CEO friends, right? They can sit down and say, hey, we're looking at this merger and acquisition. What do you think of this uh, offer or the term? Like, you just don't have that. So um, I think it's probably getting close to I don't know, 18, 19 years or something now that I've been in a part of a peer mentorship group, some informal, some formal, there's, there's lots of organizations that do it. Um, and uh, I think it's critical because you, you know, you need to learn from their lessons and um, you know, it's even just nice to sit around the table and hear someone else is having a worse day than you. And um, here's how they're solving it. 
And um, I would say I've, I avoided a lot of scars by having this um, kind of round table of um, 14, 15 CEOs. And over time, I, I changed uh, groups to get to group when we were 50 people, that was the problems you have there. But when you're three, 400 people, um, and you're um, in the tens of millions of revenues, your problems do change. So you, you might want to look at that group over time. But every you think about every professional athlete, every skier, uh, they all have coaches, even amateurs have coaches. And then I CEOs who I think you look at the impact that CEOs have across the world and the globe, it's, it's huge. And yet I think most don't have some sort of mentor, right? They'll hire a contractor or consultant, but that, um, that ability and, and they're, they'll call bullshit on you. It's the one chance that, um, they, they don't have a vested interest. None of them have shares in your company. Um, so when they give you advice, it's not because they want to raise a promotion or more shares. It's really rare that you can get that advice. So I highly recommend make your own, join one. There's there's lots of organizations, but I would say that's a um, as a as a geek developer who who had to move into the subtleties of managing culture and companies and funding um, and be a multinational selling in dozens of countries. Um, the advice from the right person, at the right time in that group is uh, critical. And you were talking about now culture. I mean, I know that, you know, culture has been a, a really big component and, and something that that you've, especially with UITV, has take, have taken very, very seriously. So I guess, how, how did you guys think about culture with UITV and, and, and perhaps what have been some of your, your key learnings uh, during this journey? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, early on, it's kind of organic, right? There's 10 or 15 of you, right? I mean, we, we started that with, with two of us, right? And so it just kind of organic. But as you grow and you add, you have to be somewhat thoughtful about it. And so for me, for sure, involve my wife a fair bit to help, you know, to add that aspect to it. You've got to listen. Um, but I think you have to also distill it down because when you're very young, it's like, oh, we have a culture of, we like to race cars, whatever, because five, you like to race, but you, you know, sure. But then as you start getting larger and larger, you have to really distill it down and make sure that the right things are getting picked in there. But like a brand, they own it, not you. And I, I think spending a lot of time thinking about that, um, we did a lot, um, on profiling people. So they understand, you know, introverts, extroverts, detail oriented, not so they can really understand who they are and where they want to go. And so putting a lot of the culture into what they want and who they want to be is, is key. Uh, if you take care of your people, right, then they'll take care of the business. So we had a lot of uh, belief around that, but then just having fun. But then how do you have fun when you're, you know, when we were way back, we had Nerf war battles. Okay. Well, that's fun when you're 10 or 15. What's fun when you're two, 300 people, you know, go and do yeah. citywide um, treasure hunts. So always putting a, a thought into that, knowing that that investment a will help for recruitment and, and that they'll take, you know, your staff will love it and they'll stick around, which even uh, on exit, I think we had um, uh, dozens of people that have been there five, 10 uh, years. Wow. So talking about the exit, how many, I mean, how, how big was the business uh, when, you know, right before the acquisition happened? I mean, anything that you can share in terms of uh, employees or, or anything else? Yeah. Um, so depending on, you know, who's contracting and what's going on, 250, 300 people was kind of where we were. And we hadn't really, the focus of people, I think one year we hired 100 people in one year, but really the last two years was focusing on partnerships. So we had announced a bunch of partnerships with uh, Microsoft Ericsson, um, uh, spin out um, for media that they had announced they were going to use our tech everywhere. So it was about getting that tool in their hands. The first few years were us doing it, then it was giving it to our clients, and then it was eventually going through partners. So a, a lot of work went around that. That wasn't headcount related, um, certainly in the tens of millions of dollars of revenue. And the big focus was getting it to recurring. So we went from Four years ago, even we were probably maybe five or ten percent recurring, and we were getting up over fifty percent recurring, which was the goal, right? Um, and forty uh, percent of revenue was from customers outside North America. So really validating that um, for that to be done, because it was either exit or D round, right? D round would have been gone to, going on to IPO, um, and uh, obviously the exit was the choice we made. And um, uh, but yeah, I think that's yeah, it was an interesting one. So then you mentioned either doing a Series D or doing the exit. So why did you choose the exit, you know, doing the acquisition? And how did that acquisition, you know, how was that process like? And how did you guys end up, you know, getting to the finish line? And what did that look like? 
Yeah. Well, again, you always want to have a plan A, a B and C, right? You can't put yeah. your, that much work um, down on one option. And um, I think, you know, conditions created that the exit was, um, um, was the right one. Just if you look who was on the board and you look at, and they were pretty clear acquires about HBO and how that, you know, obviously Netflix proved that technology was key. And then um, uh, content was a commodity, right? Everyone said, oh, Netflix is a technology company. Well, we now know them now as a content company. So now all the content companies need to be technology. So I think it was going to be a, a key asset for them, as they said. So I think that made a lot of sense. And they really wanted to keep that as a differentiator. Um, it wasn't a great time to be out raising a D round. Um, I think there's a bunch of lessons learned for me about, you know, what is the key uh, KPIs that you put forward to investors? Because we had always grown revenue and I think we had eight years, seven, seven years in a row doubling revenue. That revenue is always our metric. But really, we were at that inflection point where it was about developers, right? We went from maybe a handful of developers three years ago using our tech to hundreds of developers. And that probably was the KPI we should have been raising the D round on. We continue to raise it on funding, which when you do partnerships, it's a shared risk, future revenue. When you get developers engaged, you um, take business away from yourself to engage that community. So I, th I think there's lots of lessons learned for me on what that was. I also, you know, learned a small lesson about naming of rounds. Who would have thought it mattered, right? But we raised our A round um, from Kane. It was a private equity firm because we were profitable. We were bootstrapping the business back then. And then six months later, um, a Warner Media came in. It was Turner then and um, raised our next capital. So we dispensed with a tranche of the A. But of course, you know, they wanted to call it a B, right? It's you don't want to be the ones leading A.5, but it really was our A. So we actually ended up really early on getting off kilter on our letters. And so really our B was our A.5, our C was our B, our, our D should have been our C, right? And that does, there are all these metrics and expectations that come with the letter. Oh, so yeah. I'd go back and try and fight a bit more to say, hey, politically guys, this we, this is not our B round. Like we're, we're actually dispensing with half of what we said our A round was. So you know, it's actually a fact, it's not our full B. So that was an interesting one. So then on our D round, you'd expect a little bit more consistency and stuff, but we lose our C. So that was a, a, a tough lesson learned and we had to live with that through each round of funding. Got it. So then let's talk about the acquisition. You know, what, 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 what was that like? You know, because there's a lot of people, you know, now watching and listening that they are really focused on on raising capital. You know, perhaps they don't know that when you raise money and you're taking money in, it comes with expectations, and the expectations is returns, which is taking it to the finish line. So, obviously, the acquisition, the holy grail. You know, that's where you were able to take UITV to. So, so what did that look like? What was that? What was that process or that journey? Yeah, and, and probably a little bit unique for us in the fact that we had ATT Comcast as investors and we're a strategic platform for them. Um, so then everyone kind of looks at them as, as obvious acquirers, um, but you certainly want as many at the table as you can get. Um, so, I, you know, for us kind of just going through growing the business while having these conversations and trying to balance those was a very tricky uh, point. And of course, they were a significant part of our revenue as well. So it's like, okay, well, you know, what, what games could you play or do you play or do you just, you know, get everything going? But I think in the end, it, it went fairly quickly considering it was a, an AT&T division and it just made sense. And, and again, going back to our one of our core values was to get on every piece of glass. So UI's tagline, you know, was always um, own the glass for the biggest brands in the world. And uh, this was going to expedite that, you know, HBO, obviously, I'm not saying anything that isn't public, wants to get everywhere. And that's what our tech does. And so I think even though um, I would have loved to continue to go on, um, there is competing technology finally for what we're doing, the Google Flutter technology. Um, but we were the leader in that space. But we also wanted to get every piece of glass. And I think that was a way we can see the staff say, okay, this is what our dream is. Any, any screen you turn on is going to have our engine on it. And that certainly is expediting that. So I think that was it aligned with what we were starting the business, what we started to do. It aligned as an exit that made sense for uh, all of our investors. And, and we had diversity, as I mentioned, in those investors with, with diverse expectations. So it achieved all those. So in the end, everybody kind of, um, you know, got what we needed to do at the time we needed to do it. But it's, yeah, it's never tricky. Not everybody wants to do it and not the way they want it done. And no, you know, a good deal means nobody's happy, right? All these things that you you yeah. learn when you deal in a peer mentoring group, when they've, I think across the groups I've mentored, probably 30, 40 businesses were sold. So I got to hear all these different stories. So you, you kind of go in with a little bit of, um, 
uh, awareness, and then yeah, you 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 make it uh, make it happen. And in this case, it was reported over a hundred million. So pretty good for someone that was born in a small town there in you know in Canada. So yeah, and, and it converts that? like that's that's you know you add thirty percent on top of that because that's our I guess because the Canadian dollar. So yeah. Oh yeah. So I guess say. In that case, I mean, what was that day like? That that day like that? All of a sudden, you know, you see this contract with all these zeros in there. You know, what was that like for you? Make 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 that make us be insiders. Yeah, so it's interesting. It happens, especially if you're on the inside. You see it coming slower, and and you know, you kind of see the stages, right? So it, unfortunately, it's a, it's a little anticlimactic. It's not like winning a lottery ticket, but unlike winning a lottery ticket, I think usually you know you you earned it and you, and you you got it. But yeah, it's a it's a different you know it's it's kind of what's the next phase look like um, you know I'm now in a stage where um, you know I can kind of do what I want I think that's the interesting one prior to that even though maybe I had the wealth to say hey I've made enough money I don't have to stay working at UI personally regardless you don't you would never give up your baby you have to bring it to, this is the first time I don't have a baby and I can do what I want I think that's an interesting stage to be at um and one that it's the the next stage i've got to work through personally what do you want to do you know before it was like well you 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 have this you had this business you have this in front of you um to just truly be able to choose what you want um all excuses gone will be interesting um but yeah the exit side i mean get my 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 main advice is have the right people around you you know if you don't have the right lawyers and the right support and people that know how to sell a business like yourself like critical um because it's there's a million moving parts there's hundreds of pages of documents um certain things matter certain things don't and knowing of the 200 things that just came back in a red line what are the two that need my attention to negotiate like those are really key um so that that was i think a big piece for us was just i, I had people that i trusted uh, around me and again a lot also because of the peer mentoring i was able to get hey who have you had success with boom these people so yeah no absolutely so so I guess uh, one of the questions that I typically ask the guests that come on the show is, imagine if I put you on a time machine and we're able to go back in time and we have that younger Jason that is uh, coming out of these jobs and, and you know, thinking about starting something, you know, right before Enable, not your first business. Imagine you have the opportunity of have a chat, of having a chat with your younger self, with that younger Jason. What would be that? one piece of business advice that you would give to your younger self before launching a business and why, given what you know now? Yeah, um, I, I would bring that art and science lesson earlier in my career. I think, you know, selling commodity tech that is just a little better, you know, one of 50 people that can do it, um, you know, differentiate, be a brand, go premium. I would say I would have pushed that sooner in my career. Um, it's, it's just not, you know, to, yeah, it's just, it's very, I, some people are good at doing it and grinding and, and, and doing the next Walmart, but wow, not at all of interest. And I think um, I was early days as a geek uh, programmer, I was way too focused on that. And I think um, telling myself to mix those together and, and focus on, on making everything beautiful and technically accurate sooner. I mean, we're in that era in the experience era right now. We have been for 10, 20 years. I would have liked to be on the leading edge of it. Um, now it's a commodity, right? You, even on Kickstarter, you get a, a thing and the box is beautiful and, you know, they know every edge has to be rounded and perfect. So we're in that era. I would have liked to have been in that era a little sooner and have skipped some of the grind of, you know, really low day rates and uh, trying to deliver on something that you wanted to, but the budget budget uh, wasn't there because you'd, you know, um, gone down market too far. Or, yeah. I hear you. So Jason, for the people that are listening, what is the best way for them to reach out and say hi? Yeah. I mean, LinkedIn is probably the best way. Uh, that's the, um, uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I think I've still got my access set to open. Um, I'm, um, you know, uh, always happy to talk to fellow fellow entrepreneurs. I find as as much as I can share the experience in my 20 years in startups, I find I always learn something from them as well. So uh, yeah, amazing. Well, Jason, thank you so much for being on the Dealmaker Show today. Alejandro, my pleasure. 